Hello listeners, and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing energy matters in an informal setting. This week, we return again to developments in the gas market. The weather's starting to get cold, and Europe is already withdrawing from storage facilities. Can we expect an end to Russian gas deliveries, both LNG and piped? And what's the outlook for prices? Could we get anywhere close to 300 euros a megawatt hour? Helping me, Richard Sverson, to discuss these issues and much, much more are Eleni Papadopoulou of Kepler and Nadia Martin Wigan of Pareto. A warm welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'd like to start uh, by looking at uh, the market prices where we are now. We're almost we're below half what we were at the at the peak uh, earlier this year. Nadia, what 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 what's going on at the moment? What's driving prices primarily? Well, the current change. I mean, we're we're down from the highs, but we're up from the lows, right? The highs were because we were, of course, in the summer rushing to build storage to prepare for winter, right? And this was. A, an abnormal trading uh, opportunity. And then when everyone is suddenly buying and you have new buyers in the market, prices go up. At the same time, when we are having a shortage in storage of power, you know, for from hydro and uh, nuclear facilities were down, right? So that's why things got abnormally high in the summer. Um, since the shoulder period, which would really be considered second half of September, October, the start of November, those were uncharacteristically warm weeks um, for Europe in particular. So as a result, we didn't start drawing down any of our European storages that we built up over 90% during that period. We only started drawing it down a little bit in November. And to be frank, I mean, in Oslo, it's only starting to get cold in the last couple of days. <laughs> So that is why, you know, we haven't seen really that demand that we've seen characteristically in other years because it's a late start uh, to the to the winter. What, what's your view here, Eleni? Would do you expect us to see with you know to to maintain this sort of 130 to 150 euro per megawatt range in the coming weeks into the new year? I think it's a combination of factors that we need to bear in mind. Um, weather is playing a big role um, as of um, lately and more so as we move um, further out into the winter season. Um, so even on a daily basis, um, for example, on 28th of November, with less wind, the UK had to burn more gas and utilize more of its electricity imports from other countries. And National Grid at some point flagged its electricity saving demand flexibility service for the next day, but it cancelled it on the same day. And that was reflected in uh, the prices, uh, which were higher initially and then eased out later, later on. Um, so the market is still very nervous um, early in the winter, despite the fact that we have high inventories. And we can see that also reflected in the market prices, even from announcements that are probable and not definite. So, for example, uh, Gazprom threatening to reduce supplies via Ukraine on 22nd of November. We saw that reflect in the prices, but it didn't actually occur later on. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, if I can turn to you, Nadia, and say, you know, you mentioned it's early December. It's only just starting to get cold in, in Northern Europe. Um, has the market been a bit complacent? I mean, thinking that, you know, given the, the mild weather and uh, that thinking, well, winter's, you know, it's quite far away. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's keep burning gas. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, we've seen a significant amount of demand destruction across industry, you know, since the summer. Uh, you know, at first it was around 10 percent, then it was 20 percent. Um, you know, our general call to get through the winter was that we would need a 10 percent destruction in demand. And we see that. So I would say that side of the market is absolutely not complacent. And we don't really see that jumping higher right now. I think there is uh, almost a situation, though, where you know, if you take the perspective of a trader or someone who is a storage owner, that really paid up for natural gas in the summer, has it sitting in storage. You're almost incentivized 
to bring in new LNG cargoes. I'm sure Lenny can comment on this more, um, you know, and not sort of close off the losing trade at levels as they are right now. And because we haven't really started drawing down on the storage, it's not an issue. Um, and of course, when we look at the competition for that LNG, we haven't had the cold weather in Asia that is spurred on buying. We haven't had a comeback in China. China is going the other way. The fourth quarter is a more severe lockdown than we expected. And we see the ramifications across natural gas demand and oil demand, both on parent demand and real demand. Um, so I, I don't think that the market is complacent at all. I think the market is actually adequately prepared and has never been in such a high storage situation in Europe before ex-COVID um, and therefore is trying to make sense of what to do next. And of course, it can change very quickly. Um, and then we start to have these steep drawdowns. So I think it's more of waiting to see how quickly things change, and then we will see the reaction. Uh, Eleni, what 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 do you think here? What's uh, on the supply side? Um, you know, last week's podcast talked about a thirty BCM shortfall uh, for the coming winter. Is this something that you also see or think? In my view, the market has not been overconfident. And as Nadia mentioned, there were some good preventative measures taken, for example, in terms of storage. Uh, the European Commission mandated the target of 80% full storage for every European member state by November. And it actually reached that target uh, earlier on, ahead of schedule. And mild weather as well helped Europe delay the gas withdrawal se season to mid-November now. So um, in terms of LNG import capacity, yes, it's being tested, um, but also there are initiatives to add infrastructure and expand existing ones. For example, uh, recently Spain and France boosted capacity of iron gas pipeline by 66%. And there was a joint project pipeline between um, Danish Energy Net and Polish gas transmission system operator gas system, which added the Baltic the pipe. The Baltic yeah. pipe, mm. exactly. And so that's also adding another layer of energy security to Europe. US LNG has played a key role in the European supply mix, but we also need to bear in mind that Russia LNG has continued to flow and saw an annual increase in November. There are limitations on how much more gas pipeline suppliers are able to ship to Europe and agreed with Nadia that demand distraction has been a critical element into helping bridge the gap as well. And we might see that um, energy saving measures will play even be bigger role um, coming winter. So, so far we have been managing well and expecting to continue to do so. Just to summarize, we have the cushion from the storage gas, but also if prices should help, uh, then further out demand distraction will come into play. What 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 do you think here, Nadia? Were you, were you... I, I just wanted to add on to, uh, you know, when Lenny also was bringing up the part about the demand destruction we've seen, you know, I commented really only on the industrial side, but I think when we think about the personal side, you know, that could be much stickier um, in terms of people's habits changing. And so I think that that is a very interesting element for us to consider on how much demand will Europe need in the future if everyone becomes more used to having cooler temperatures in their house and is just thinking about that consumption uh, going forward. So I, I think we have this first real test uh, in the market. And then the other thing I wanted to add is that, you know, we overshot the goal of 90% storage levels. I mean, we were almost at 98% at the high. And so that is when we also think about how we were all modeling how much you know demand destruction we had to have because we overachieved on that first level you know it's also given us a leg up and i think that's something very important for us to remember for next year that if we are only at 90 percent next year and we have the same winter it's not going to be as loose and if we have a faster start to the winter, then it will be tighter, you know, and that is before we start thinking about the extra supply issues and things like that uh, going forward. So we really over prepared and overshot our uh, 
expectations. Which is a good and a bad thing in a way then, Nadia. Um... Well, it's especially bad for those who built up the storage. Of <laughs> well, absolutely, absolutely. Prices. So it's mm. uh, and, and you know even things that we've seen, like for example, Equinor, right? When they stop injecting gas into some of their oil fields in order to maximize the amount of gas that they can send to Europe, you know that raised their output five to eight percent, and that is a temporary measure. With prices as they are now, they're not incentivized to do that as much, but it's not something that they would switch after eight weeks of changing uh, of a change in that price. You know, it's a longer term decision. And so that is something that they will have to think about for next year and see what our situation is. I mean, that's, that's interesting. And I, I'd like to, to ask you, Eleni, about you mentioned about Russian LNG that's still flowing into Europe. Is that that's still happening as we speak? Is it? Yes, it is. I mean, this is quite. Could you could you explain how how that can happen when when all the you know is is that sanction breaking or you know how has that uh, been been happening? So we've been uh, seeing an increase actually in terms of um, Russian LNG exports on the rise, even to Europe, and this comes despite the major plant that the Yamal LNG working at the hundred and ten percent utilization rate. So uh, Russia tries to export as many cargoes of LNG as possible uh, since there is the wake of uh, the cut in uh, pipeline supplies to Europe. But it is very interesting from a political perspective because, of course, China, uh, sorry, Russia is choosing not to send that gas through the pipelines, right? And instead, they are increasing exports in LNG. But I think that this is especially indicating kind of their view in the medium term that they're realizing that Europe isn't going to be their number one buyer anymore. So they need to develop that export capacity as much as possible, utilize it. Okay, sell it to Europe at a price now, but then plan to sell it elsewhere. But of course, China is not buying now, so they're not going to buy Euro, uh, you know, uh, European loaded LNG and take it all the way to China. Absolutely. Is this is this what your view as well, Eleni? I mean, how uh, can we expect these uh, these LNG shipments from Yamal to continue? In terms of the forecast, unless until we hear more in terms of any announcements, I mean, aside from what's happening on the oil side, it's business as usual. So, for example, for Nord Stream, there might be actually delay to um, April 2023. But everything else in Russia side, we expect business as usual. And obviously, there are upside risk if anything else happens. I mean, there, there are longer term targets in, uh, to actually be in free of um, Russian gas from your perspective. But yeah, in terms of um, talking about this winter ahead. It's business as usual. That's very interesting. I mean, if we talk about pipeline flows from Russia, um, Nadia, have you been surprised that they're still flowing and they've even kind of increased a touch? Well, it's quite minimal. <laughs> I mean, of course, when, when I speak to gas traders about this, I think once we sort of hit the 35 MCM a day mark, 28, you know, that's basically zero. And then they say, well, if it drops to zero, nothing will happen. And of course, the price still jumps when it goes to zero. But I think it's very much priced into people's heads that it's not flowing. I mean, Equinor is actually sending gas all the way to Ukraine, for example. That is not something that I would have expected at all um, when this war broke out. So I, I think we still see very minimal flows. And the market assumption is that, yeah, that might as well be zero. And next year, it basically will be. Mm. When next year do you expect them to, to hit zero? Well, uh, interesting question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess uh, it's it's almost funny that they haven't really sent it to zero. You know, maybe it's um, so I, I don't know, probably maybe ahead of the winter, you know, historically. The games between Russia and uh, Central and Western Europe have taken place in the summer. So maybe already in the summer that will happen. That's the big buying up period. Make us pay more, for example. So I, I think that could already happen there. And that is where, you know, when we think about the LNG market, we think in terms of a year on year number. When we think of winters, we think in terms of winters, right? 
but from like a shipping perspective, you know, when, when we think about our expectations for next year, we assume that it is zero and it's where we expect this year's LNG imports into Europe will have jumped 11% year on year. Well, we expect a further 54% jump next year. And that is a massive difference. At least that's the call for the LNG. And, you know, we won't actually all make it in, but that is, uh, you know, how much we think this market will actually need more um, LNG coming in. What's your view, Eleni? What, what, what do you think about, um, you know, the Russian flows and if they could, could seize completely? Is this something that you've um, modelled in as well into your analysis? We've previously even done a webinar on it. Um, it I mean, if we've covered it as part of the webinar. And in order to actually um, look into reducing substantially Russian gas flow, um, there has to be a multiple factor in place. So, um, we have to have a combination of LNG, additional pipeline supply, and demand destruction. We'll see storage drawdown to balance the European gas market and so on. But it, there is a question in terms of daily volatility and whether that would actually create any shortages in terms of, and when I say shortages, I mean just um, maybe demand destruction. Um, on specific days. And as I mentioned before, um, that will also be weather driven on some specific days. And sometimes we also have the element of surprise when, for example, like in August um, this year, when prices reached over uh, 300 megawatt, uh, euro per megawatt hour, um, we saw multiple factors um, playing out to get this acute situation, like low imports to Europe, announcement of national maintenance, Norwegian outages, and so on. But um, for this kind of black swan events to happen at the same time, I mean, that's something that we try to look into by running scenarios. Ab- absolutely. What, what, but what are your expectations in term of, terms of LNG imports, uh, Eleni? Um, you know, we've seen record numbers uh, coming to Europe in November. Do you, do you expect this trend to continue? We do expect additional LNG imports into Europe, um, especially in light of winter demand, but also some stocks will be drawn down. We're expecting a bit more overlapping supply, or let me call it LNG availability rather than supply into Europe, uh, just because of the way um, expectations are for um, Asian demand. For example, while we are seeing increased imports, LNG imports into parts of Northeast Asia, we are also seeing quite well stocked storage sites. And I'm talking about LNG inventories, for example, in Japan or South Korea. There is a question mark in terms of how gas demand will perform in China, especially in light of COVID related lockdowns and slowing the economy, high gas prices and so on. But our expectation is that yeah, it will uh, prop up demand, but it will be um, limited. Okay, what, what what do you think here, Nadia? I mean, what uh, you mentioned, uh, like Eleni, the the lockdowns in China, the, the you know the demand is is much lower than it would otherwise be. Um, what are your expectations for for the coming months in terms of demand? Will will it will these LNG shipments still flow to Europe, or will they you know maybe further out come you know um, as things ease in China um, flow more to be shipped more to China? Um, well, first, just to start with our outlook for 2022, I mean, the IAA had been forecasting 3% growth in real na- natural gas demand for this year. And our expectation is that that will be very much a disappointment. It will be flat to negative. Um, you know, we have negative oil demand in China this year for the first time since 2006, not even in the great financial crisis did we have negative oil demand. I think the story looks very similar on the gas side. Um, and however, we expect that come the first quarter, China will start buying LNG. China will stop, will start buying um, oil. And this is because we expect the lockdowns kind of to start coming off in the second quarter. But when you're the world's largest importer of oil and such an important player as well, 
on the gas side. You're not going to announce we're out of zero COVID and then start buying. You need to start buying ahead of time. And so this is where we expect to start seeing those shipments really flying over there. And that'll be the first signal that China will ease out, uh, will ease up in our view. So I think in the first quarter, the ease we've had in securing cargoes and the prices it is not here to stay. I think um, when we look on, and, and this is actually an interesting point, when Eleni was talking about storage, right? And if we compare the regions and countries of the world in storage capacity, right? There's been a big gripe in Europe that, oh, our storage capacity is insufficient relative to our demand because it doesn't even cover 50% of what we need in winter, right? Well, guess what? We have the largest storage capacity relative to our demand needs out of any other region. The next best is Japan. Then we have the US, which is, of course, the huge net exporter producer. So it doesn't really matter, relatively speaking, if they have that relative storage capacity. Then you have South Korea and then you have China. So China is actually the lowest. And, you know, according to our estimates, we think that that's less than 10 percent coverage of their actual demand. Um, so when we look on the rest of Asian demand year to date, it's also been, you know, quite disappointing. You know, we've had flat demand in terms of our expectations in India for natural gas, you know, versus a big jump last year as they came out of COVID. We have negative demand growth expectations in Japan. Part of that is because they're bringing their nuclear uh, facilities back line. And, you know, when we look at emerging Asia, that's flat. And emerging Asia particularly looks disastrous because, you know, Germany and Europe are taking their FSRUs. And so they can't even use them to actually bring in LNG. You know, it's, uh, so I think that uh, China is going to be the big driver in that, but other countries as well can really start uh, hitting the gas on that. And I, I think that as we see China coming out of these lockdowns, we will see, you know, in terms of the global macro picture, the recessionary pressures we've seen today are partially a result of the supply chain, chain shortages that are, visible around the world because China has remained in lockdown when everyone else basically hasn't, right? So when we start to have that revival in China, I think we'll, it will ease up things all over the place, all over the world. We can stop having such high interest rate bumps and then we'll just see demand actually coming back in other regions as well. So I think it's looking to be a very, very tight picture for, for next year. For next year, this, do you share that view, uh, Eleni? I mean, is is the race for LNG and LNG cargoes is that going to hot up in in twenty twenty three? Maybe uh, as early as uh, the second quarter or the first quarter, even. You did mention it. Everything will boil down to what happens this winter for storage, and weather will determine that as well. All parties, in a way, will uh, have to observe in terms of anything that might actually impact any part of supply and demand in multiple places. As we head into colder weather, uh, seasonally colder weather, and gas for uh, heating demand actually is more sought after, the competition will um, is expected to intensify. And it will be very interesting to be doing the um, research and analysis on this. So yeah. Mm. Absolutely, I think it's going to be a you know as 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 Nadia also mentioned, it's going to be a a very uh, interesting uh, year, twenty twenty three, and probably quite a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, yeah, and in terms of um, China, um, for example, um, it is a big player to watch out for in terms of gas, in terms of any developments there. I touched briefly upon um, demand side. There are lots of things domestically as well, uh, in terms of other fuels and in terms of even upstream. So there might be additional uh, pipeline deliveries from Russia to China next year with um, commissioning of new gas wells and the new field there. So um, there are multiple factors we need to look into, and it makes it a bit more complicated to get a bigger, uh, wider picture in terms of uncertainties and try to weather that out further out. And it also very much depends on policy driven, what actions are going to be taken from regulatory point of view. 
because there are some expectations uh, for some further actions, and we need to see how that plays out as well. And one example would be some infrastructure developments like um, new LNG terminals coming up in Germany, whether they're going ahead on time or being um, delayed, what happens on the power side across the world. So, for example, we've seen the impact in France with the nuclear situation uh, lately. We need to see what happens in terms of price gaps. The European Commission recently proposed the idea of a gas price cap uh, in order to limit excessive gas price spikes. And the proposal consists of a safety price ceiling of 275 euros per megawatt hour on the month ahead TTF. But there are two main conditions for that, that the price has to exceed the 275 euro per megawatt hour level for two consecutive weeks and that they are higher by 58 euros per megawatt hour than the LNG reference price for 10 consecutive trading days within those two weeks. So we've seen quite a few different feedback, let's say, from different countries for this idea or this proposal not being as effective enough in terms of like its level, duration and scope. And I would say like we are expecting to see the outcome of the other meeting in mid-December between EU members to finalize a decision. Exactly. I mean, l- last week's pod dealt quite, uh, uh, quite in quite depth about the price cap issue uh, with some countries having labelled it a joke. I don't know what your view is, Nadia, but I think, uh, you know, a final question really, as unfortunately we're running out of time, but, um, you know, the, one of the core tenets of the European policy is that companies and countries even stand together um, and, and, and purchase purchase gas together or certainly cooperate. Is that realistic? Well, I... It, it, it is an idea, but it's, you know, are they going to do it in the short term or the long term? You know, the the main thing, just to also mention on the gas price thing, I'm one of the believers that it doesn't really do anything uh, because it's at a much higher level than what we've seen. And it does nothing to alleviate the problem of supply. It suggests a little bit of this tricky point of moral hazard for producers. And that's why I think they had to set it so high to show that this can only be used in absolute extreme situations. We're not going to start overriding market relationships. And that is something that I think is extremely important in Europe and why we have done so well, um, you know, flourishing on so many fronts is we are a good regulatory, stable system historically. That's why renewables can come in, all of these sorts of things. This crisis has started to show change. And when these sorts of things, um, you know, a small change for a government is actually a very big change to to the market, both to producers and to investors. And I think we're in a very dangerous situation introducing measures like this. And so if the European Union as a whole wants to do something, my advice is we need to sign long-term contracts with multiple providers, including Equinor including the United States, not only rely on the Middle East, you know, we have to diversify on that side and uh, and other places, and then we'll be in a better situation. And then we can do it as a body altogether to ensure that backup spot. Sounds sounds fair enough, Nadia, absolutely. So I think we'll, we'll end on a slight warning, but also on the bright side, a, a call for diversification of, of supply. So um, Eleni and Nadia, thank you very much for being guests on the Montel Weekly Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message, any suggestions, questions, or you know, let us know if you if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.